Layla. Welcome back to our channel, Elementary My Dear, where we make nutrition science easy for you to digest. Today, we actually have a viewer question, which is super exciting. When it made it, our day. It made my week, honestly. This viewer had a really interesting question, and I'm actually surprised that we haven't touched on it already. Basically, this person is a bodybuilder, and they were talking about the differences they see in their body during their pre-competition phase and their off-season phase, based on the amount of body fat that they have. They were just wondering, what is the effect of having low body fat on different aspects of health, both physiological health, so like what's happening in your body, and psychologically? So today we're going to answer the question of what happens when you have low body fat? What happens to your body? How does that affect the systems that are happening in your body? Yeah, this question really brings up the point that I think often in our society, body fat is viewed almost exclusively as a negative thing, you know, other than the breasts and the buttocks. You're allowed to have fat there, but it's almost like anywhere else is viewed in a negative way, which is really unfortunate because body fat is actually really important for our overall health and actually does some important functions in our body. I think the one that probably everyone knows about is the fact that it is a source of stored energy, but on top of that, it also serves as thermal insulation. It forms a cushion around our organs to protect our organs. Believe it or not, body fat actually also produces hormones, things like estrogen and leptin. When we talk about body fat as an energy source, I think it's really important to note that this is the energy source that your body relies on the most because we have three macronutrients. We have carbohydrates, we have fats, and we have proteins. And proteins, its primary purpose is to build things up in the body rather than provide energy. And then carbohydrates, you really only have enough carbohydrates stored in your body for about a day or so. Over the long term, fat is what makes sure that you have enough energy, especially if you think about you know, our history as a species where you might not be eating for a day or two. If it wasn't for fat, we'd be dead. Your body will resort to that stored fat to use as energy when your energy intake or your calorie intake is below your energy expenditure. So if you're eating less calories than your body needs to do its day-to-day -day functioning, then your body will tap into those fat stores. In the context of bodybuilding and bikini competitions specifically, they want to get rid of the excess fat so that they can see all the muscles that are in the body because you have your muscle and then you have skin and in between there, there is a layer of fat called subcutaneous fat. And I find bodybuilding so interesting because it's almost like a lesson in anatomy like in some of the people you can literally see the striations mm -hmm. like the individual like muscle fibers in those types of competitions there's like two elements of it because they do extensive training to really build up those muscles approaching nearing the competition they also want to be in somewhat of a calorie deficit so that they can burn through that fat as well to really make those muscles pop <laughs> as much as possible it takes a lot of discipline the people that participate in this are definitely very dedicated to this craft. Just reading over the viewer's question, she's talking about some of the symptoms that she's experiencing as she goes into that pre-competition phase, as she gets into that really lean body mass. And I think seeing these symptoms kind of begs the question, okay, what really is a healthy amount of body fat? She mentioned that she gets down to about 11 to 13% body fat. First of all, body fat percentage, what that means is it's the proportion of body fat to total body mass. I think the natural question is like, well, what's a healthy body fat percentage? And what's interesting is that there actually isn't that much research done on this. There actually isn't a lot of research looking at the connection between body fat percentage and things like morbidity or mortality. And I think it's just because it can be hard to measure, it's expensive to measure, and oftentimes body mass index is used instead because that's so much cheaper. All you need is to measure height and weight. BMI has been thought to be a proxy for body fatness, even though at this point we know that for a large part of the population, the correlation isn't quite there, but it is still what's kind of relied on the most. You know, we have our normal weight and our underweight and our overweight and obese classes of BMI, but there's no consistent definition of underweight and normal weight and overweight adiposity like levels, yeah. like percentage of adiposity. The American Council on Exercise, ACE, they had their chart that was there. Those body fat percentages seem to only be found on exercise or fitness related sources. And I think it is based more on aesthetics. I think it is. 
as opposed to health. When you look at a lot of the sources, when it comes to what's considered normal or acceptable body fat percentage, for females, that's 25 to 31 percent, and for males, it's 18 to 24 percent. Anything above that 31 percent for females and 24 percent for males is considered to be associated with obesity. On the other end of the spectrum, the essential fat for females, it's 10 to 13 percent body fat, and for males, it's 2 to 5 percent body fat. Something that's really interesting about these numbers about like I guess like what's like essential body fat and normal weight body fat is the way that they were determined. For men specifically we have this really narrow range of what is essential body fat of two to five percent. When they say essential body fat they mean the minimum that your body can have within it because the way that they found this number is basically from starvation studies. You might be familiar with the Minnesota starvation experiment and they just found that like after about two to five percent body fat they just weren't losing any more fat. And then there's been a few studies after that that replicate the same kind of findings, is that in men, you're not gonna ever get below two to 5%. Having said all that, you might be wondering, well, how can I find out what my body fat percentage is? There's actually a lot of different ways that that can be measured or estimated. And actually the lab that we both worked at had a top of the line body composition measuring machine. We were very proud of we it. We were very proud of it, yes. It's the bod pod. That method is called air displacement plethysmography. And then there are other methods too. There is skin fold caliber, there's DEXAs, bioelectrical impedance, hydrostatic weighing. Mm -hmm. But I will say all of these require obviously equipment and they all require some level of skill or training to be able to use properly. And I would say other than the skin fold calipers, most of those are expensive to access as well. And you know, when we're talking about like, I guess the gold standard uh, types of measures, we have the DEXA, we have the BOD pod, we have MRIs. Those pieces of equipment are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Really the point there is it's really hard to measure adiposity. So that's why I think things like BMI have become a lot more prevalent and that's what yeah. we base things on because most people have a general idea of their weight and, and their height. So now let's get down to it. What happens when you get to a really low body fat percentage? The context of the question was, you know, bikini competition, bodybuilding, but I think it kind of applies to a lot of different contexts. I think you know, extreme calorie restriction for just people that are dieting. Some of the things that we're gonna be talking about, we also see in eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa as well. I think that kind of sounds really scary actually to be like, this is happening to people with anorexia nervosa, also people who are uh, on extreme diets and people who are doing these kind of competitions. Your body's reaction to caloric restriction and extreme weight loss over short periods of time it's kind of the same. No matter what the motivation is. And some of the things that we're going to be talking about, we kind of highlighted some of the limitations in the research. When it comes to this question, it is sometimes hard to tease out the difference between what's being caused by very low body fat versus extreme calorie restriction. And yes, even though extreme calorie restriction typically does result in lower body fat, it doesn't necessarily work out that way all the time. So some of the things that we we're talking about could be more about the calorie restriction as opposed to the body fat. Some of it is based on the body fat percentage. We'll, we'll give you the information as we go. Yeah, the place to really start here is talking about, you know, your body's complex system for trying to like maintain everything the same. Your body does not like change. Change as a whole in your body has typically led to death. When your body is detecting that it's getting fewer calories, it's having lots of fat loss, there are changes that tend to happen when you're you know, not eating as much, your body's gonna try and drive you to eat. Also, it's gonna try and reduce the amount of energy that you're expending. That's known as your basal metabolic rate, which is the amount of energy your body uses just like doing things that aren't moving, digesting food, breathing, making proteins, all those kind of different things. It's gonna to start to downregulate that. So you're losing less weight, it's gonna try and drive you to eat more, and that leads to changes in certain hormones. When we see very low calorie diets and fat loss, we see increases in cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and in ghrelin, which is a hormone that drives you to want to eat. Conversely, we also see decreases in the hormones leptin, insulin, testosterone, estrogen, and thyroid hormones. And we're gonna see how a lot of these impact the symptoms that you actually experience when you're going through this process. Let's talk about the thyroid hormones first. So when you go through that extreme calorie restriction or the low body fat, 
What that does is impair the function of your thyroid gland, which means that you're producing less thyroid hormones. Your thyroid hormones essentially regulate how your body uses energy. So you have those lower levels of those thyroid hormones, your metabolism actually slows down. And because of that, you're very likely to feel more tired, feel lethargic, feel fatigued. And that kind of directly leads into the next impact, which is just feeling more cold all the time. I mean, you might remember like high school physics, you know, a lot of the processes and systems, there's always energy kind of being lost as heat. And that goes for our metabolism as well. So all the things that our bodies are doing to keep us alive, there is heat being produced in that process. So when our metabolism slows down, Naturally, what that means is that you're also producing less heat. On top of that, one of the main roles of fat is as an insulator. It's a great insulator. And so if you're reducing the amount of fat that you have in your body, you have less layers. So it's like you kind of like took a jacket off and then you also, the heater in your body is not running as effectively. As we talked about, a lot of the studies into the amount of body fat you need are in men and it seems like men have a lot lower threshold for like the minimum amount of fat to just like survive. And while there's limited research there, females tend to have that higher amount of body fat that is required. A lot of the hormones within the female body can be very dysregulated by very low calorie diets and low body fat. One common thing that we see with people that do very low calorie diets or experience extreme fat loss is losing your period. And the reason for that is that going through that process actually affects the release of a hormone called gonadotropic releasing hormone. And that hormone is actually responsible for releasing follicle stimulating hormone, which helps mature the follicles in our ovaries as well as luteinizing hormone, which is responsible for ovulation. Basically our entire reproductive system, there's kind of like a wrench thrown in it. And the symptom that we can kind of see from the outside is not getting a period. I think that not getting a period is the most apparent symptom, but along with that comes with all kinds of other reproductive dysregulation. So you're also having an ovulation, so you're not ovulating. So you're not able to get pregnant during that time. And honestly, I'm wondering like, I'm sure that this is a biological thing is that if you're not getting enough energy or your body stores are really low, it might be, okay, you're not healthy enough to produce an offspring. And so we're just gonna shut this whole thing down. Absolutely. I think the common theme with a lot of the changes that we were talking about is that your body's like prioritizing things that are vital for your survival. And it kind of pauses all of the other things that maybe seem more like bonus. Loss of the period and loss of regular reproductive function isn't necessarily due to only low body fat. That definitely is a factor, but in the case of extreme exercise, which I imagine someone who's doing like a bodybuilding competition would be doing, that also increases your cortisol levels from lots of stress. So that coupled with low energy intake just plays even more into that feedback loop between your brain, which is producing this hormone. This disruption to the reproductive system is called functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. Believe it or not, what comes along with that is also compromised bone health. And the reason for that is a lot of the changes that we talked about, things like lower level of estrogen and higher levels of cortisol. Both of these things affect our bone health. So what's weird about our bones is that it's constantly breaking down and rebuilding. That's all fine and dandy. As long as, you know, the rate at which it's being rebuilt is the same as the rate at which it's being broken down. As soon as you get to the point where you're breaking down your bones faster than you're rebuilding, that means that your bone mineral density is gonna go down and you're increasing your risk for osteoporosis and fractures. The changes in your hormones, like lower levels of estrogen and higher levels of cortisol, both increase the rate of bone resorption or the rate at which your bone is breaking down. That increases your risk for osteoporosis, which is basically the medical condition of your bones being brittle and fragile, making you more prone to fractures. And this is especially important for women because osteoporosis is typically seen in women. Making sure that you have a good availability of energy consistently can help make sure that your bones are like 
pretty balanced out when they're breaking down and rebuilding. What we touched on today are kind of probably the most notable symptoms and the things that come up the most often. But all these hormones, the thyroid hormones, leptin, ghrelin, testosterone, estrogen, play multi-systemic effects. They affect your whole body. And so really having these low levels of body fat, especially over a long period of time, can have many, many systemic effects that you know, maybe less common or maybe we don't even know about yet. Furthermore, when you're reducing your caloric intake, that typically means that you're eating less food. And food doesn't only contain calories, it also contains many other really important nutrients. Reducing how much food you're eating can lead to certain nutrient deficiencies. One of the symptoms that we see with bodybuilding as well as in eating disorders like anorexia nervosa is being very easily bruised as well. And it is thought that that is due to nutritional deficiencies such as vitamin C. And again, this is just one example of something that's easily visible from the outside. But of course, if you're having nutritional deficiencies, especially over the long term, of course, that's probably doing a lot more damage on the inside that perhaps we won't see until maybe decades later. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, am I screwed? Am I screwed? I did bodybuilding. What am I going to do? The good news is, is that a lot of these hormones, you know, within a couple months of being out of the competition phase, eating normally, eating a full diet with adequate calories, they do go back to normal. However, there are a couple hormones like testosterone and thyroid hormones that we're seeing even after a few months don't quite go back to normal and what that means is that your metabolic rate is likely still going to stay lower and a common practice to combat that or to address that in this space is a thing called reverse dieting what people do is increase their calorie intake over time very slowly and incrementally and maybe an extra 100 calories a week and very slowly increasing it back up from there. And the hope there is that by doing that slowly, that your metabolism will slowly maybe trust your body again or something and will slowly pick back up. And the hope again is that your body will not hold on to that extra energy as fat. However, it's unclear whether it actually works out that way in practice. I don't think we necessarily have that evidence. Ultimately, I think, you know, within this competitive bodybuilding space, as well as outside of it, I think generally there seems to be a consistent and constant drive in people to lose body fat. And it's very unfortunate because body fat, like we just talked about, does play a really important role in our bodies. And going through that process, whether it's for competition or whether it's for, you know, just dieting in your day to day life can lead to both short term and long term systemic changes. As much as we villainize body fat, which as we touched on in the beginning is I think largely to do with aesthetics and what people look like and whatever the opposite is often ignored and i think people do know like you can be overweight and you can be too skinny but we never really focus on that and the effects that that does have on your body you have effects that affect parts of your brain and like the hormones that you release it affects the amount of calories that your body burns like breathing and digesting things which you know that's a big deal. Like yeah. your body is spending the energy to breathe and digest things because that's like necessary, you know, and your ability to reproduce the amount of hormones that you are producing that affects your bones, your cardiovascular system, all kinds of different things like that. And it's something that we just don't pay attention to because we have this bias towards skinniness. Today, we just went over some of the physical changes that happen, but going through that type of process actually also has very deep implications for your psychological health and your mental health. And we're going to do a whole other video on that. Thanks guys for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe with the notification bell so you never miss one of our videos. Follow us on our Instagram and our TikTok. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye.